So far, we have studied the constitutive behavior of linear elastic materials, and we've shown that for a linear elastic isotropic material, the relationship between the stress and the strain can be represented by two constants, or can be fully described by two constants, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. And what we're going to discuss in this um, part of the lectures is what are the restrictions? Are there any restrictions on these two constants, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio? And then we are going to discuss the plain isotropic linear elastic material constitutive laws. So the, the, the question that we want to answer right now is, are there any bounds for Young's modulus? Can, can, I, can I have, for example, Young's modulus equal to negative 100 MP? What does it mean that a negative Young's modulus? Or what are, why do we always say that Poisson's ratio is between 0 0.5 and, and negative 1? Can I have Poisson's ratio equal to negative 1? Can I have Poisson's ratio e equal to 0.5? What does all these things mean? Now, the answer to the question is, Young's modulus has to be positive and Poisson's ratio has to be somewhere between 0.5 and negative 1. And the question is why? And this is what we're going to discuss in the next uh, uh, bit. Now to discuss this, we need to uh, define what a linear elastic material is. A linear elastic material is a material that the relationship between the stress and the strain is linear. So sigma versus strain is linear. And material does not dissipate energy. Okay, so what does the term energy, uh, or how can we calculate this energy which, um, which the material does not dissipate? This energy is the integral of, starting from zero, if this is the relationship between sigma one one and epsilon one one, the energy is this area, which, if this is the stress that corresponds to the strain, is equal to the, this area of this triangle, which is half sigma 1, 1 epsilon 1. And if we have all the different stresses in the same uh, incident, uh, in, uh, at the same instance, and we have all the strain components in the same instance, then the strain energy is the sum of all the different components, sigma 1, 1 epsilon 1, 1 sigma 2, 2 epsilon 2, 2, sigma 3, 3 epsilon 3, 3, sigma 1, 2 epsilon 1, 2, plus sigma 2, 1 epsilon 2, 1, and since sigma on 2 is equal to sigma 2 1 and sigma and epsilon 1 2 is equal to epsilon 2 1 I have a 2 here so this replaces sigma 1 2 epsilon 1 2 plus sigma 2 1 epsilon 2 1 and similarly for this and similarly for those shear components so every so the energy that's stored inside a continuum is at a point due to the uh, having stress and strain is equal to this sum. Now, knowing that we wrote the stress utilizing the vector representation of the stress, we presented the stress as a vector. And that we also represented the strain as a vector because of symmetry. We only used those components, and we multiplied epsilon one two by two, epsilon one three one three by two, and epsilon two three by two. 
then we can see that the energy is equal to half the dot product between those components and those components or, the, or this vector and this vector because when I take the dot product between the stress and the strain I get sigma 1 epsilon 1 1 sigma 2 2 epsilon 2 2 sigma 3 3 epsilon 3 3 and so on so the energy is equal to that dot product and since I have a relationship between I know that this vector is equal to a matrix multiplied by the strain vector I can replace the strain I can the dot product I can exchange the stress and the strain and I can write epsilon dot instead of sigma I'm going to put C epsilon so what we are saying here is that this energy under any state of stress the strain energy has to be positive we're going to utilize this fact and try different states of stress and ensure that the strain energy is positive and see what restrictions these put on the two constants that we that describe my linear elastic material which are Young's model and Poisson's ratio so let's see the first state what happens in a uniaxial stress state in a uniaxial stress case I have a material and let's put, or I have a specimen, and let's assume that this is E1, E2, and E3. The only stress component I have is sigma on 1, everything else is 0. So the stress matrix has sigma on 1, and everything else is 0. The strain matrix, well, epsilon on 1 is equal to sigma on 1 over E plus 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 everything else is 0 epsilon 2 2 is equal to negative Poisson's ratio sigma on 1 over E and so on we have the relationship and so the strain matrix looks like this sigma on 1 over E the shear strain is 0 shear strain is 0 negative Poisson's ratio sigma on 1 over E 0, 0, negative Poisson's ratio, sigma on 1 over E. In this case, the energy of deformation, the energy that goes inside this object that is required to apply this stress, this energy is equal to half each stress component multiplied by the corresponding strain component. Now the only non-zero stress component is sigma on 1. So I'm going to write sigma on 1, epsilon on 1, plus sigma 2, 2, epsilon 2, 2, plus, and so on. The only non-zero component is sigma on 1, so I'm going to put half sigma on 1 squared, or sigma on 1 and epsilon on 1 is equal to sigma on 1 over E, which is equal to half sigma on 1 squared over E. For the energy to always be greater than 0, the Young's model has to be greater than 0. Basically, what we're saying is if this is sigma on 1 and this is e, epsilon on 1, as long as I'm increasing sigma on 1, the material has to have and increasing epsilon on 1. So E has to always gre be greater than 0. I cannot have a material where under compressive stress I get a tensile strain. So such a material is not considered linear elastic. So therefore E has to be greater than 0. And this is the first restriction. E cannot be equal to 0 otherwise it's here E cannot be so E cannot be equal to 0 otherwise the 
material no stiffness he cannot equal to infinity because material becomes becomes rigid now maybe there are materials that are rigid which means you cannot really deform them whatever stress you apply but this material it, I do not consider it linear elastic material so if I have a material where whatever stress I apply there is no strain I do not consider this material to be linear elastic and if I have a material that I don't need to apply any stress for the strain to increase I don't consider this material linear elastic so when E is zero, this is not a linear elastic material. And when E is infinity, this is not a linear elastic material. Anything in between linear elastic is considered linear elastic material. Okay, so this is the first restriction. Now let's try a different stress state and see how this affects our uh, uh, material constants. The next stress state is sigma on 2 a shear stress state so the stress matrix everything is 0 except sigma on 2 when you calculate the strain using the constitutive behavior the relationship that we described before you're going to find that all the strains are zero except epsilon 1 2 which is equal to sigma 1 2 over g basically epsilon 1 2 is equal to sigma 1 2 over 2 g okay and we know that g for linear elastic isotropic material is equal to e to 1 plus plus 1's ratio So what about the energy? The energy, if you look to the components, to, if you look to the equation, sigma 1, one epsilon one, 1, sigma 2, 2, epsilon 2, 2, and 2, sigma 1, 2, epsilon 1, 2, everything else is 0, which is equal to half multiplied by 2, sigma 1, 2, and epsilon 1, 2 is equal to sigma 1, 2 over 2g, which is equal to sigma 1, 2 squared, over 2g for u to be always greater than 0 g has to be greater than 0 now g is equal to e divided by 2 1 plus Poisson's ratio we already established that e is greater than 0 so therefore 1 plus Poisson's ratio has to be greater than 0 or Poisson's ratio has to be greater than negative 1 what would happen if Poisson's ratio is equal to negative 1 if Poisson's ratio is equal to negative 1 g was the shear modulus will be equal to e divided by 0 e divided by 0 is infinite which means the material is rigid in shear which means that the strain is equal to zero. So if Poisson's ratio is equal to negative one, G is equal to infinity, which means the material can never deform under shear stress and if such material exists I do not consider it linear elastic and so the restriction is Poisson's ratio has to be strictly higher than negative one it cannot even it cannot be equal to negative one 
Okay. One more restriction, which is that Poisson's ratio should be less than 0.5. How can we find this uh, restriction? We utilize a different stress state, put P, or pull with a P, pull with a P. this case the stress is equal to P from all directions a hydrostatic st stress case the strain epsilon 1 1 is equal to Sigma 1 1 over E minus Poisson's ratio epsilon 2 2 over E minus Poisson's ratio epsilon 3 3 over E and you're gonna find that this is true for epsilon 2 2 and this is true for epsilon 3 3 and epsilon 1 2 is equal to epsilon 2 3 3 is equal to epsilon 1 3 is equal to 0 the shear strains are 0 and the longitudinal strains are equal to 1 minus 2 Poisson's ratio P over E 0 0 0 1 minus 2 Poisson's ratio P over E 0 1 minus 2 Poisson's ratio P over E in this case, the energy that goes into the deformation is equal to the stress component multiplied by the corresponding strain component. And since those three stresses have those three identical strains, so this will be half multiplied by three because I have three similar terms. Sigma on one multiplied by The corresponding strain component. For u greater than zero, we already established that e is greater than zero. p squared will has to be greater than zero. Therefore, one minus two Poisson's ratio has to be greater than zero. From here, Poisson's ratio is less than so let's do it 1 is greater than 2 Poisson's ratio from here 1 over 2 is greater than Poisson's ratio which means strictly speaking Poisson's ratio is less than half what will happen if Poisson's ratio equal 0.5 go 1 over 2 then under a hydrostatic state of stress material will exhibit zero strain I do not consider this material linear elastic and so finally the restrictions are from the above E has to be greater than zero. G is greater than zero. Poisson's ratio is somewhere between negative or somewhere between positive half and negative one. It cannot be half and it cannot be negative one. S for an orthotropic material, if we follow the same line of argument, we can reach similar um, we can reach similar inequalities and the inequalities dictate that all these Young's moduli and the shear moduli they have to be greater than zero then we have this relationship 
between the uh, um, that relates Poisson's ratio and the Young's moduli and another relationship that actually relates to Poisson's ratio. Now, in your book, we uh, also present a different method. using the fact that C has to be positive definite. For U to be greater than zero, which means that, which leads to the same conclusion. So if you have, uh, if you'd like to take this further, try to prove those arguments using the fact that the relationship between the stress and the strain has to be positive definite so and I can give you a hint since it's symmetric you can use um, since C is symmetric then find its eigenvalues and ensure eigenvalues are greater than zero. Okay, so, so far we have studied the relationship between stress and the strain for in a linear elastic material and we have shown some restrictions on the relationship between the uh, uh, some restrictions on the values of the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. In the next section, we are going to look at situations where we can simplify the relationship between the stress and the strain. Right now, the relationship between the, st the stress and the strain looks like this. I have every six components of the stress. are related to using a 6 by 6 matrix that has some zeros but usually 6 by 6 matrix that's related to 6 components of the strain now in some situations when our problems are only in a plane I can utilize that a lot of these or some of these components are zero to simplify the relationship between the stress and the strain. So I'm going to simplify this relationship in two cases. A case called plain stress and another case called plain strain. So what is the difference between a case that's called plain stress and a case that's called plain strain? In a plain stress case, A material or an object has stress applied only in one plane. So for example, what you see here in figure A, usually plates, thin plates that are allowed to contract and to expand, and the stress is only applied in E1 and E2. The stress matrix in this case can only have sigma on 2, sigma on 1, or sigma 2, 2, and the rest are always 0. And so this is called plain stress case. A plain strain case is when the, the, when the material or the structure is not allowed to deform in the third direction. Structure cannot deform in third direction. When the structure cannot deform in third direction and if the, st the stress or the forces are applied on the structure throughout the length of the structure, if the forces are applied on the structure throughout the whole length of the structure, so this is a continuous structure, I can simplify the structure and look at one cross-section 
and I can look at my screen and simplify the screen or actually not simplify the screen this the screen in fact is only the only non-zero components are epsilon 1 1 epsilon 1 2 epsilon 1 2 epsilon 2 2 and the rest are zero it's only in the plane of 1 and 2 in the plane described by e1 and e2 another uh, simplification is also when the material is axisymmetric high axisymmetric when the loads are cylindrical and the structure is cylindrical and the boundary conditions are cylindrical I can extract one cross section and from this one cross section I can look that the strains are equal to epsilon 1 1 epsilon 1 2 epsilon 1 2 epsilon 2 2 and zeros and the strain the material as it moves out it expands as it moves in it contracts so there is a strain in the third direction so let's look at the relation what happens in those three cases to the relationship between the stress and the strain case one plane stress in a plane stress case I'm saying that I have a value for sigma 1 1 a value for sigma 2 2 I'm assuming sigma 3 3 is 0 but this is not necessarily true for epsilon 3 3 sigma 1 2 has a value sigma 1 3 is 0 sigma 2 3 is 0 which means I can simply extract since sigma 3 3 is 0 I don't have to show it here and then I have a relationship between epsilon 1 1 and the only non-zero components, epsilon 2, 2, the only non-zero components, and epsilon 1, 2, and the only non-zero components. In addition to this unknown epsilon 3, 3, that tells me in a plane stress case what's happening to the thickness of the plate. And so I have this, the relationship becomes much simpler and I have a three by three matrix rather than a six by six matrix, three by three matrix. And if I call this matrix D and then I take that matrix and I invert it, this is the inverse of D. In a plane stress the relationship between the stress and the strain is given by this equation or is given by this equation in a plane strain case for example let's consider a dam that's really long infinitely long and the loads on this dam are also following the length of the dam and if this cross-section is the cross-section of E1 and E2 and the long direction is E3 is the direction of the basis factor E3 a plane strain means I have a value for e epsilon 1, 1 a value for epsilon 2 2 epsilon 3 3 has to be 0 a value for epsilon 1 2 epsilon 1 3 has to be 0 and epsilon 2 3 has to be 0 now notice that I don't that sigma 3 3 is not necessarily 0 because what prevents this object from expanding or contracting is a stress in the third direction so I would probably have some sigma 3 3 that prevents this cross-section from expanding or contracting so I'm gonna use this last this 
epsilon 33 equals zero to replace sigma 33 because I don't want to see sigma 33 in the equation negative Poisson's ratio sigma on 1 over e negative Poisson's ratio sigma 2 2 over e plus sigma 3 3 over e this is equal to the z 0 we can cancel the e and you get a relation you can replace sigma 3 3 by negative Poisson's ratio sigma on 1 negative Poisson's ratio sigma 2 2 now if you take that and put it here instead then you get a relationship between epsilon on 1 and sigma on 1 and sigma 2 2 because I don't see sigma 3 3 anymore I see this instead because now epsilon on 1 will be equal to sigma on 1 over e minus Poisson's ratio sigma 2 2 over e minus Poisson's ratio instead of sigma 3 3 I'm gonna utilize this new expression and you end up with this relationship between epsilon 1 1 epsilon 2 2 and sigma 1 1 sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3 oh I'm sorry uh, this relationship this has to be positive and so this is positive And so you end up with this relationship between three components of stress and three components of the strain. And don't forget that the sigma 3 3 is still related to sigma 1 1 sigma 2 2 using this relationship. And if this is, if this matrix, if I call this D, then this is inverse of D. And you can use Mathematica to verify that this matrix, once you invert it, you get this matrix, which is called C. And these relationships are only valid in the plain strain case. Now let's, uh, just a quick note in a plane strain case what do we have for the stress and what do we have for the strain well it's plane strain so obviously epsilon one, one epsilon two two epsilon one two epsilon one two and the rest are zeros corresponding correspondingly I have these values of the stresses but what makes epsilon 330 is a stress in the third direction in a plane stress case as the name implies I have sigma on 1 sigma on 2 sigma on 2 sigma 2 2 0 0 0 0 0 and the strain in this case epsilon 1 1 epsilon 1 2 epsilon 1 2 epsilon 2 2 0 0 and since it's a plane stress case means the material is allowed to freely expand or contract in the third direction so I have a value not necessarily 0 for the strain in the third direction so and the relationship between the, the stress and the strain those less because now we have a smaller number of components because we have a smaller number of components the relationship between the stress and the strain becomes much simpler and I have a 3 by 3 matrix rather than a large 6 by 6 matrix For axisymmetry, I'm not going to ask you about axisymmetry in the exam, but for axisymmetry, the strain is equal to epsilon 1, 1, epsilon 1, 2, and 
because in an axisymmetric case and this is my cross section the material is allowed to expand or contract in the third direction if this is E1 and this is E2 this is E3 as the object moves out the circumference becomes bigger which means we have now epsilon 3 3 as it moves in the circumference becomes smaller so and there is a relationship between that horizontal displacement and epsilon 3 3 maybe try to prove this relationship but I'm not going to ask you about it in the exam and the stress also we have sigma 1 1 sigma 1 2 sigma 1 2 sigma 2 2 and also we have sigma 3 3 a stress in the circumferential direction so this is it for this uh, section and we're gonna have another uh, last uh, part for the for the for this chapter for the constitutive behavior where we're going to discuss a few problems